When tonight's first-time developers set out on their money-making journey, the market was booming. They joined the gold rush and set about modernising one of the trickiest developments you can find, Grade 2 listed properties. We did look at what Grade 2 listed meant before we bought it. But you've taken all the ceilings down and you've taken all the fireplaces out. Oats houses are notoriously difficult to develop and they are money pits. Conservation have come back and said no. And if it wasn't challenging enough, then the market starts to unravel, leaving them right in the eye of the storm. The chances of us selling it and making a profit is close to zero as you can get. You just think, oh, well, sod it, let's just not do anything then and leave it to rot. There is added stress with the market dropping. Also is. It's November 2007. In Bristol, the property market has already stalled, just as psychologist Paul Clayton and wife Karen, a telecoms manager, buy this five-bedroom period property. It's their first ever development, and they're planning to make a profit by turning it into a luxury family home. They're off to a quick start. In the two weeks they've owned the property, it's already been completely stripped out. That would be commendable, but for one big problem. The property is grade two listed. Did you know much about Grade 2 listed houses when you we bought it? We did look at what Grade 2 listed meant before we bought it. And what do you understand that to mean? That we, we can replumb, rewire, and we can repair. do it and repair. And we can do anything that doesn't actually change the physical nature of the building. But you've taken all the ceilings down and you've taken all the fireplaces out. The architect had put together a spec. Um, which said remove fireplaces. Now we hadn't agreed or signed off that spec. He gave that to the, the builders team and of course they worked through the spec and removed the fireplaces because it was on the list. I think there could be a tricky conversation with the listings officer. Altering the fabric of a listed building without consent is a criminal act. Paul and Karen could get a large fine and be forced to reinstate everything they've touched. It's a scary start. And what's worse, when you look at the basic figures, it's absolutely terrifying. They bought the property for £300,000. Their budget of 160000 is small for such a big house, but they plan to sell for an outrageously high £600,000. Their target profit of 140000 wouldn't stack up, even if the market was on their side. So where do you base your figure of 600 from? It's not my figure, it's Paul being really <laughs> hopelessly optimistic. It's based on the fact that there's a house down the road for 800,000 and it's, it, it's bigger and it, we seem to be like the step down from that house. And I've spoken to the agent who's selling that about this house and he knows this house and he feels that just under half a million is is the realistic resale for this. That's £100,000 less than they're hoping for, and I think the modernisation is going to cost them more. Currently, the property is divided into two flats. They want to turn it back into a luxury five-bed family home. But getting the ground floor right isn't going to be easy. At the moment, there's a kitchen and reception room at the front, and there's another at the back with an enormous Victorian range and bread oven slap bang in the middle. Karen and Paul want to get rid of the front kitchen and replace it with a dining room. And then they want to create one large kitchen diner at the back. But having the range in the middle stops them creating the open plan space that appeals to families and they can't see a solution. Now, to make the back of this house work well, you need it to be lighter and brighter because mm. that's how people want to live nowadays. Mm. So to stand a chance of getting that top value for this, you, you need to make it lighter and brighter and you can't do it with a great lump of masonry like that blocking off the garden. Mm. It, it looks nice, yes, but it's right in the middle of the room. And if I was you, I'd go to the conservation officer and say, look, can we move this? Just don't have it there. Perhaps over against the wall, that would be a better place. Just anywhere apart from the middle of the room. It may not be easy persuading him to move it. It may not be as simple as it sounds. 
I think you need to tread very carefully with this. And when you speak to the conservation officer, don't try and do lots of things, just try and uh, get permission to do the one thing that really matters. And this really matters for this house. You want to open the whole of that back wall mm. up and, and knock this down. Moving the bread oven would mean Karen and Paul would create a spectacular kitchen breakfast room overlooking the lovely garden and give this house the very best layout for modern family living. So you have to move it? Yeah, I mean, it, you're pushing at an open door with me because that's always been my view that it needs to go, but that's persuading Paul. I, I don't think that you're going to have a bottom line at all if you don't move it, and that absolutely trounces any possibility of having a great kitchen breakfast room back here. You, I mean, it's gone. After I leave, the enormity of their challenge is just starting to sink in. Now I feel drained. I feel like my head's been sort of whirring and whizzing from about second minute in to about, to about now. And if the difficulties of the development weren't bad enough, house sales are already in decline. I think I still believe that we've got a really, really nice house, potentially, um, but it's just a bit mind-blowing at the moment. 180 miles away in Kent, sales manager Roby Hilliard and his wife Jo also think that a complicated listed building is the answer to secure their financial future. We've taken on um, something that we know nothing about. It's, um, it's an agricultural building. It's listed. It's never been lived in. It's um, falling down in places. <laughs> It's a 19th century Grade II listed oast house on a farm in Faversham, Kent. Traditionally used for drying and pressing hops for beer, Roby and Joe are risking everything to convert it into a three-bedroom family home. So, an oast house? Hmm. Why did you buy an oast house? When we saw the pictures, we thought, well, we won't even bother looking at it. It's just too much work. I still don't really know how we've ended up. With it. With it. Yeah. <laughs> How much did you know about listed buildings before you bought this? Not a lot. Nothing. No, not much. <laughs> so you have no experience of listed buildings, no. but you thought that you'd take on, on this derelict yeah. oast house as a mm. first off. Have you had a chat with the conservation officer? Has he been yeah. round here? Yep. And what did he say? Did you get on well? He's, yeah, I mean, he's, he's um, as they all are, he's very keen to, to maintain, you know, the, the fabric of the building. And so are we, you know, that's why, that's why we're, we're in this. It's a gorgeous building. But um, we can see that there's going to have to be some compromises on both parts because mm. there, are, there are some basic things that we feel are necessary for this to be a, a home. So not only have you got a Grade 2 listed yeah. building, you've got a Grade 2 listed building that wasn't designed to be lived in lived in anyway yeah. and you're converting it into a house mm -hmm. and and you've never done anything like this before we've never done anything like this before Brilliant. And, and it's also <laughs> isn't it this should be fun <laughs> Roby and Joe bought this derelict oast house for 225,000 pounds they're hoping not to spend more than 150,000 renovating it and sell it for 450,000, making them a 75,000 pound profit. Their renovation costs are totally unrealistic and I think Roby and Joe have totally underestimated the challenge ahead. Oast houses are notoriously difficult to, to develop and they are money pits. Many would call this derelict rather than unmodernised mm -hmm. and very difficult to convert. How do you feel? Are you... Nervous? Now you tell us. <laughs> you should make some money, and I'm just not sure how so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's September 2007 and the word subprime has entered our vocabulary. UK banks are jittery and quietly withdrawing their riskier mortgage products. The true extent of Britain's toxic debt is still to be revealed. And like most people, Roby and Joe Hilliard have no idea how much trouble is coming. Their dream is simple, to convert a derelict 19th century oast house into a three-bedroom family home with a tidy profit. Goodness, look at this. This is fantastic. So this would have been where all the hops were laid out, up on the floor above. That's right, yeah. And then the oven would have been lit in here and then it would have... Somewhere around here an oven would have been hot. lit. So it's basically like a massive oven in here, isn't it, really? That's right, yeah. Mm. 
It might be full of charm and character, but turning this Grade 2 listed Oast House into a modern family home is going to be very difficult. And I think Roby and Joe's plans are way off the mark. On the ground floor, Roby and Joe are putting their sitting room in the dark base of the drying tower, leading through to an equally pokey dining room, kitchen diner and a downstairs WC. To increase light down here, upstairs they're planning a galleried landing and then the master bedroom will go in the drying tower with ensuite. Two further bedrooms and a bathroom are to be squeezed awkwardly around the hot press. And what did uh, the conservation officer say about moving it? Um, basically, it's a, it's a no-go area. It was a, a, a very tentative conversation, but you could tell from, from his reaction that this is fundamentally part of the fabric of the building that they won't want to see go. Is there anything else that you're kind of head-to-head -head on at the moment? Um, he's raised um, concerns about the, uh, the gallery, the gallery landing. Because you'd have to cut the joists back and that yeah. would disturb the fabric of the building? Yeah, that's it. I've got an idea that completely turns all your ideas on their head. It also has the great advantage of the fact that you don't have to fight the conservation officer for anything. Upstairs in the main barn, I think Roby and Joe should lose the troublesome gallery landing, the family bathroom and two of the bedrooms and instead make use of this great space as a living area. The hot press would then become a central feature in what will effectively be an upside-down house. It's certainly different to what we were planning to do, mm. so that will take a little bit of thinking about. But you could keep this press and have it within a spectacular sitting room here. And I love the idea of being able to, to use this space and really appreciate the building that you're in uh, whilst you're living in it, as opposed to having the bedrooms up here where you're sleeping most of the time and you're not seeing the building. Downstairs, Roby and Joe could still have two good-sized bedrooms, a bathroom and a snug in the main part of the barn. And to make this development a real triumph, leave the space in the roundel for an incredible, spectacular kitchen diner. I do like the idea of the kitchen in the roundel, but I think my only reservation with that is to the money side of things. You have to swallow that. And, and yeah. cope with that and yeah, cut back elsewhere. Yeah. In this difficult development, in a tricky market, there's no room for error. The layout has to be spot on to stand a chance of getting any return, but I don't think Roby and Joe quite see that yet. But I'm still not sure about the bedrooms being downstairs. The major concern will be getting light in there, but I'm not sure it's going to work. <laughs> Five hours away in Bristol, Karen and Paul Clayton also have problems with their Grade 2 listed Georgian property. They want to make a profit by turning it into a modern family home, but success hangs on getting permission to remove an old bread oven. But they'll be driven by what the conservation guy says. Yeah. If he says we can move it, then that'd be great. I mean, I'm going to be heartbroken if he says we can't. Yeah, I, mean, I think I'll be too then. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm, bought, I'm bought into the vision. They now have to convince conservation officers it's a good idea. But Karen and Paul have already carried out lots of work without permission, which doesn't exactly put them in the strongest bargaining position. This is the sort of feature we'd be looking to sort of primarily retain. So what we're saying is the likelihood of moving this is negligible if, if almost bordering on a no. You wouldn't. In terms of in terms of this, if this were just an application in its own right, could yeah. to, to move this or from or take it away from the site, we'd be looking to refuse this element of the scheme. That sounds like a definite no then. That does sound like a no <laughs> to me. Very polite no. <laughs> <laughs> the first rule of developing a listed building is having an early and open dialogue with conservation. Without it, Karen and Paul were always going to be on the back foot, and now they're stuck with one serious problem. It doesn't make you feel inclined to take on listed buildings and do anything, and you just think, oh, well, sod it, let's just not do anything then and leave it to rot. <laughs> it is just, just a hideous, useless monstrosity as far as I'm concerned. Waste of space. But the bad news doesn't stop with the range. Permission to put in two en suites and double doors to the garden, both crucial in a large family home, are also refused. Faced with making a crippling loss, Karen and Paul down tools and put up a fight. Back in 
Faversham, Joe and Roby still haven't finalised their plans on their listed building, but at least some of the groundwork can start. It's the first day of the build. We've waited a long, long time to get to this stage and it's really, really exciting to see it all starting to take shape. Roby and Joe's budget is so tight they don't have the cash to throw at this development. But if they don't get it right, they won't stand a chance of making a profit. To help overcome the problems of converting this farm building into a home, I think the best solution is to turn their development upside down and put the main living area and master bedroom upstairs and have two of the bedrooms and a snug and a spectacular kitchen downstairs. But I think they're having difficulty visualising my plans, so I've brought them to another oast house just a few miles away. Now, this is a great kitchen. It's fantastic. And with a circular room like this, you can have really impressive features like this, which is quite sensational, actually. Because as you come into this room, you do look at it and think, how amazing they've, they've actually curved the worktop around the room. Is this how you would in, had envisaged that a kitchen would be in a, in a Randall? Um, I had trouble thinking how the units would sort of sit against the curved wall. Um, but they actually fit really neatly and nicely and I, I think it all works really well. Your kitchen is going to be the room that really impresses people when they come into your development and I don't think you can afford to scrimp and save at all with the kitchen. That is going to be the feature that people go home and, and mean, mean that they simply can't resist buying your house. I mean, you've got £10,000 budgeted for your kitchen, haven't you? Something like that, yeah. I don't think you probably need to spend as much as 20, but it's over 10 that mm. you're, you're looking at. It's, it's sort of the 15 would probably be a, mm. a more realistic level to, to budget for. You've got to make people feel, quite okay, I'm going to buy this Oast house, not the house down the road, because that's amazing. I think it, it's, um, you know, what makes the round, the, the Oast is the round, isn't it? And if you can get the kitchen in there, you're going to just enhance, you know, one, one of the best features of the house. Making the kitchen the big feature in the Randall is only half the battle. I also want Roby and Joe to see the drawback of having the sitting room downstairs. And there's no sense that this is an oast house. There's one beam and a low ceiling, and this, this is quite a dark room, and it has more windows than you're going to have. Mm. Actually, it doesn't really do very much, this room. Whereas this oast house in Cranbrook, Kent, is a great example of having a sitting room upstairs. The one big open space has large amounts of light coming in and with exposed beams it really celebrates the feeling of the building and means they don't have to battle with conservation to move the old press. Back in Bristol, Karen and Paul have given up on moving the bread oven but are still fighting conservation to get permission to put in double doors at the back and two on suites. It turns into one huge negotiation and weeks turn into months. It's frustrating having to stop. It would be great if we could carry on doing with what we're doing. We're still paying mortgage on it. It means that we've got to try and replan and try and reschedule the builders and all those sorts of things. So there is a, a bit of rework, but it's easier to, to make sure we don't make mistakes at this end rather than having to go back and undo many mistakes later further down the road when it's more expensive and probably more time consuming anyway so it's a case of trying to find things we still can do when well, there's a big garden out there to play with so no, keep me busy winter turns into spring a mind-numbing five more months passes where they do very little more than weed the garden and watch as the property market goes into freefall. Until September 2008, nine months after they bought the house and today they hear from the council. With our planning application, we're able to do most of what we wanted so we can put a nice big opening in the back of the house, we can put some en suites in, um, the only thing we didn't even bother to, to include in our application because the conservation team had been round on site was we didn't bother to put in an application to remove the bread oven or the range because it would have been a waste of time and money. Finally, this development can get going. Planning has compromised on some of the work they did, but this project is still lurching towards financial crisis. Karen and Paul decide to get their hands dirty. We're doing... Uh... A lot of the ripping out and any unskilled stuff because it saves costs 
Oh. <laughs> it's an admirable effort, but after nine months of mortgage payments in a viciously falling market, I'm not sure it's going to be enough to save this development. You bought this for £300,000 and your budget was £160,000, so you would have been in at £460,000. Now, I know you were originally hoping to get £600,000, but realistically, I think <laughs> five hundred was closer yeah. to reality yeah. and and the market's dropped by 15%, so you're down at 425 mm -hmm. and you're in at uh, 460, so you're looking at 45 resale, 460 costs, and that's a... That's a £35,000 loss mm. Mm. at best, mm. yeah. which is a which is a grey situation for this. I mean, in terms of a business deal, it's not a great one, is it? <laughs> not in the short term, no. No. It's not, not a great short term deal, but I, I'm not prepared. I don't want to sell it at a loss. Five hours away in Faversham and the falling market has already hit Joe and Roby's bottom line and there's more bad news for the profit margin. Uh, the full underpinning, courtesy of the, uh, the council, um, is going to cost us 25,000. Sliced into the profit, um, obviously the contingency's gone completely, and uh, we've got the small matter of trying to find the money as well. Roby and Joe thought they'd get away with spending 6,000 pounds on a touch of underpinning here and there. And then, two days later, they hear back from the Conservation Department about the galleried landing. Conservation have come back and said no, um, and that's really going to spoil what we want to do. So, what do we do now, then? We're not asking for anything radical. No. Um, if, we, if we were asking for something radical that had been uh, turned down, then you could understand it, but we need to find out how we go about appealing against it. Roby and Joe's schedule has already slipped, their budget has started to rocket, and the market's only going in one direction. This is not the time to start battling with conservation. To appeal a decision by a local conservation officer is a very, very lengthy, time-consuming process, mm. which is going to cost you, I mean, a lot of time and a lot of money as well. We, we, we don't feel that they're being um, fair. How's your budget at the moment? Uh, money's tight. Where, where is it now? Because you were hoping to spend 150,000, right? Yeah, the budget's 180,000. It's gone up by 30,000 already. Mm. We'll have to give it a certain amount of time and see what stage we're at. And if it looks like it's just not going to happen, then we just have to drop it and yeah, then we, move we, on. Yeah, we, we agree. You know, we, we haven't got a bottomless pit. The key is that you've said that you're not going to do it for long. Mm. And as long as that's the case, then, you know, good luck with the fight. But, uh, but I would, as soon as you can, I'd drop mm. it and move on because you can get really, really sucked into this sort of spiral of, of, uh, yeah. of discord. And, and I could do, so <laughs> I'm, I'm aware of that. Yeah, yeah. so I, it... I think it's good advice. Even though Roby and Joe are paying thousands in mortgage payments, they can't help themselves but put in the appeal anyway. This project needs one serious change of direction. Thankfully, when they see the ground floor opened up, they reconsider my suggestions. So, uh, enough's enough. We've decided uh, that we're not going to fight uh, conservation anymore over the void. Uh, we are going to go with Sarah's plans. Um, albeit it's taken us uh, a bit of time to get our heads around it. So uh, hopefully it will be a, a great success, and if it is, that'll be down to us. Uh, and if it's not, uh, then that'll be down to Sarah. It's October 2008, and the UK is on the brink of recession. But no amount of doom and gloom is going to take the pure joy from Karen and Paul as they unleash nine months' worth of frustration on their development in Bristol. It's a massive weight off your shoulders to know that you can actually do something, that you can actually knock things down, put holes where they were, build up bits where they weren't, because you can. It just feels like the sort of, uh, best orgasm I've ever had, really. <laughs> <laughs> With the amateur work all over, the professionals move in and start opening up the back of the house, ready to take the large new double doors onto the garden. 
leaving Karen and Paul to turn their attentions to the major problems inside. The conservation officers won't allow them to move the old bread oven, and this is preventing them creating their dream open plan kitchen diner. Now, you're originally going to be having one massive space here, and because of that bread oven, you're now going to have two spaces. This space we're in, and the space beyond. Yep. So how are you going to have the layout? I think it's got to go at the back, because it feeds straight onto the garden. We're going to have a huge, great big French window. It just seems like the best place to put the kitchen. Karen, what do you reckon? I think this room is slightly bigger. So therefore, if you're looking to get a family dining in here, then that might be a better bet. This is an horrible room for a kitchen. <laughs> it's a lovely room, a big, couple of big settees, telly in the corner, supper on your lap. What else does a man want in life? <laughs> uh, well, so where are they going to eat if the kitchen's at the back, in the back room? In here. Where's the table? When was the last time we were at a table? So you're suggesting it's a five-bedroom family house with no table in the kitchen or anywhere to sit at to eat? Where do we still... eat every night at home? We eat at the table in the kitchen. Yes. And we've got a lovely room in there to have a dining room. If you don't think you're going to traipse your dinner through there every night... This is a family house, so someone's going to go and make their breakfast in here. So, and then have a tray of all the kids' cereal and, and carry the tray... Trip up the step. ...kids' cereal, tripping over the step, through the sitting room and all the way into the dining room. And by room. this time, yes. one child has already dropped their cornflakes. You're mad. To have a family house without a kitchen breakfast room is a really big problem when you come to sell it. It's your only option to save this house as a family house. I thought I've been battered, but... I, I, yes, it makes sense. So that's agreed, then. Kitchen in here. Yes. Cool. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Layout problems solved, but the truth is Karen and Paul had hoped to finish their development months ago. It's a brutal lesson in the risks of developing a listed property. And even now that the site's up and running, there's no way of cutting corners. Every bit of old lime plaster has to be replaced like for like, at double the price of regular plastering. All the crumbling old joists have to be preserved and new joists threaded between them in another lengthy and costly process. To me, I don't really understand why we've got to preserve rotten old timber, which is not actually doing a function. It, it, it's not holding the floors up or anything, and nobody's going to see it because the floors are going to go back down. But that was one of the conditions of getting our, our um, listed buildings consent, so we, we haven't had got no choice, really. We've got to no. do it. But at the end of the day, we can spend hours arguing about it and time, because every month we don't work on the building, it's another month's mortgage, or we can just accept it, agree to it and crack on and do it. And yeah. I must admit, I favour the second approach at the moment. Yeah. In Faversham, fortunately, Roby and Joe decided against a lengthy appeal on their development and things are really moving. The galleried landing's been ditched, and the living room's going upstairs with the bedrooms on the ground floor. It might be upside down, but for this property, I'm sure it's the right way up. Ooh! <laughs> it's all uh, happening now, isn't it? Mm. Now that the walls are up, they most definitely are up. <laughs> no going back now. And these aren't partition walls, are they? They're not stud walls. <laughs> no. no. It's, uh, they're all block not. work. Unfortunately for Roby and Joe, this surge of activity turns out to be only brief. After just three weeks' work, the site once again grinds to a shuddering halt. Unfortunately, we've had a couple of fundamental disagreements with the builder, so work has stopped on site. Uh, we're trying to work those through, but basically there's some, uh, some costs uh, that have been incurred that we don't agree with. Uh, the builder's got his point of view and we've got ours and we're trying to sort those out at the moment. Um, so that leaves us once again with nobody on site. Another delay which we can... so we just don't need. Um, so it's all a bit tricky at the moment and uh, just got to try and see our way forward. The site stands still for eight weeks while mortgage payments and an increasingly difficult property market 
sucks at least £15,000 more out of the project. It's turning into a horrible roller coaster ride of a development. Somehow, Roby and Joe need to get it on the straight and narrow. It must be very stressful for you both, is it? Yeah, very stressful and frustrating. You just want to get on with it and finish it. You kind of have to make a decision. You have to take control of the situation and make a decision as to how to move forward from yeah. this point. And you are left with three options. One is that you, you sort out the dispute with him and continue with them, but that depends whether your relationship's broken down too far. The next is that you find a new contractor, but it's going to be hard to find a new main contractor when you're halfway through a job. And the third is that you, you take it on yourselves and you run it yourselves and you do it on uh, subcontractors. So you, you run it on a daily basis, which is a big job. And you work full time. You don't have any time that you can put to running this project. Are you able to run it, do you think, Jack? Putting it like that, that sounds pretty scary to me. You know, Joe's already doing a, a fair amount of work um, behind the scenes. I think full-blown project management is, is probably not an option for, for either of us. The best option here, if you possibly could, would be to continue with a contractor that you have if you can repair the relationship. But three weeks later, the site is still sat empty. Yeah, after speaking with Sarah, obviously reconciliation would have been the best route um, to enable us to go forward but we haven't been able to do that. So uh, here we are again with no, nobody here. It's 18 months into Karen and Paul's development and the build is well underway. But the lack of parking outside the house and the busy road is causing havoc for the tradesmen. And that's a real worry. Hi, where's my park? Yeah, just pop it up there, that'd be fine. OK, cool. Having a parking lottery every time you drive home is going to be a big turn-off for the potential buyers of this family house. Hiya, how are Hello. you? We're fine, and you? Fine, thanks. Goodness, that is a nightmare, that road. I mean, today I had, you know, eight bags of shopping, mm. um, but if you had a couple of kids and a whole load of shopping, it would be quite a nightmare lugging it in and out um, of the house at, across the road. And there's a busy road yeah. as well as having bad parking, so it's a kind of double whammy, really. And it's not brilliant for parking, um, yeah. but that's compensated. We have got a very large garden at the back, yeah. um, which and is an attraction to people with families, so it swings and roundabouts. You're going to be facing a downturn in its value because of the parking. Mm. I think parking is essential to this development, and that huge garden at the back of the house is one possible solution. Down this little alleyway is this massive big parking area, and your house is just over here. Yeah. Um, this area is rented out, and, and the people who own it would be willing to sell you one of the parking spaces that would enable you to have access through into the back of your garden, which means that you could then have parking for one or two cars, or even three cars. Had you thought about this as a solution, perhaps, for parking? It was on the list to do, but it's just... We've had so many things, really. How much would you be willing to, to pay for, for um, access in? 5,000 sounds a bit reasonable, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> when I spoke to the people who own this, they'd be prepared to sell you access for around £10,000. So if you're at 5,000 and they're at 10,000, it's not a million miles between to negotiate. Mm. Personally, I think it's probably worth paying 10,000 because actually it's going to make such a massive difference mm. to the house. Yeah, I think it's we haven't got £10,000. <laughs> You may not have £10,000 right at this second, but I also don't think that is a very good reason for not opening up conversation no. at this stage. Personally, I don't really think you've got a choice. When it comes to sale, I, I reckon it'll be worth 30000 less without parking. So, so there's a lot of money involved in not having parking. Mm. I think when you say it like that, we haven't really got much of a choice, really, have we? So open up talks right now and make the decision. Oh, well, once you're gone. <laughs> Back in Faversham, there's finally some good news for Roby and Joe and the truly torturous conversion of their oast house. You, you probably won't believe this, but we've, uh, we've come full circle and we're back with our 
original contractor. We've managed to uh, make concessions on both sides. And we're ready to, uh, to proceed. Well, he's back on site today, and uh, we're hoping to, uh, to move forward at quite a pace now. So the site has obviously been sitting here undeveloped for the last uh, 10 weeks. Uh, that's had a significant impact on our budget. It's uh, eating into our profit margins. And in order to recruit some of that, along with the changes in the, uh, the general property market, we're going to have to take on board you know, a lot of the finishing ourselves. And that means Joe having to be on site and take on more of the project managing. I don't find it particularly easy to, to come up here and, and walk into a room full of builders or whatever, although they're all very nice. Um, I do find it quite difficult. So <laughs> I'm sure it'll get easier with time. With the build moving forward, Roby and Joe now have to make some crucial decisions about the look they give their Oast house without blowing the rapidly shrinking budget. Getting the look of these sort of conversions right is difficult and expensive, but however tough it seems, sometimes you have to spend. Now, this is obviously a lot bigger than, than your barn, but what are the things that you notice first about mm, it? Wow. The staircase, for starters, I mean, it's lovely. I know you really need to spend less on, on your conversion, mm. But there's some areas that I don't think you can afford to spend less. And I think a spectacular staircase like this means that you can then get away with spending less elsewhere. Well, I think originally we were thinking um, to have something relatively plain just to save money. But having come in here, um, I, I don't know about you, Joe, but I'm now thinking that if we could, I think it would be worth the investment and it could be a real impact when you walk in. These three flights of stairs cost around £30,000. You obviously don't need to have three flights of stairs. You only need one flight of stairs. But I honestly think that to expect to spend around £10,000 wouldn't be unrealistic or silly in your particular development. In Bristol, one job that Paul can do is sort out the garden. It's huge and could be a fantastic selling point for a family house. But he's cutting corners. Initially, when we started thinking about the garden, we, we, we sort of were toying with the idea of about sort of four or five thousand pounds. And now, um, because of sort of the fact we're still here quite a while down the line, it's as neat as we can at the least money we can. So about a thousand pounds should be able to do it all. In a difficult market, you've got to make the best of everything you've got. And I don't think this is the right place for them to be scrimping on, particularly when their solution is cutting the garden in half. In an ideal world, um, I wouldn't like to have this, this fence here, because it's just a huge garden. There's so many things that you could do to it. But I think once people go through the gate and have a look around to see what the, the, sort of, uh, the opportunities are beyond there, you know, I think it makes people go, wow. It's been an epic 18 months since Joe and Roby started their conversion of a derelict oast house in Faversham in Kent. The property market is unrecognisable. Interest rates may have fallen spectacularly, but mortgage approvals are still at record lows. In Kent, the number of actual houses selling is down a staggering 67%. Will they have anything to salvage? Yeah, there is added stress with the market dropping. Of course there is. Um, but I suppose all the while I, I believe that I'm still coming out the right side of it, you know, it, it makes it manageable. Well, if this conversion is anything to go by, then they might just be in with a chance. The once derelict farm buildings are now a spectacular three-bedroomed family home. They turn the development on its head and, wow, does this upstairs celebrate the original architecture and make the most of the light. The master bedroom here is a fantastic contemporary contrast in the upstairs Randall. The two further bedrooms work perfectly, but the real showstopper is the kitchen in the old Randall. But all this has taken its toll on the budget. We'd allowed um, contingency and a fair bit of it, but we didn't imagine it was going to suck quite as much money out of us as it did. 
When we bought the property, the market was fairly steady. Obviously, with the market crashing around us and us investing pretty much our life savings into it, uh, we were no longer certain whether we were going to be able to make any money. Roby and Joe had originally hoped to spend £150,000 on their development, but this has now leapt to £225,000. They need to get £450,000 just to break even. And a lovely light ring. Porcelain floor tiles, coin work surfaces cut into the roundel. Very, very nice. Wow. What a lovely room. This is a great space out here. I would value the property at £495,000. I would value this property at £550,000. I would value this property at £550,000. If they do get the average, that would make an £81,000 profit, which successfully bucks the trend of this market. But has it given them the bug to take on another one? We've learnt so much uh, through this project, it would be a real shame not to um, make use of that and to do it again. Uh, I think that Joe will probably need a few months, may maybe years, to, uh, to recover from this one before she did it again. Um, and, you know, I I'd do it tomorrow. Meanwhile in Bristol, Karen and Paul are having to face up to the fact their development might not be the gold mine they'd hoped for. When we started the development, we wanted to finish it off, sell it, and then hopefully make a profit. But I guess given what's happened with property markets. The chances of us selling it and making a profit, unless someone passionately falls in love with it, it's close to zero as you can get. In Bristol, Karen and Paul are about to finish their 19-month development of a Grade 2 listed family house. Planning delays of 10 months saw their schedule triple. And as the market has gone into free fall, all hope of making a profit has long since disappeared. The question is, how much are they going to lose? We just want to get it over and done with. We're fed up thinking about it, fed up talking about it, and we sort of have a rule at the supper table that we only talk about it for, I don't know, five minutes, and then we say, right, no more, we're not going to talk about it or think about it anymore, because otherwise it just saps you and drains you. Finally, in June 2009, Paul and Karen finished the transformation of their once tired and outdated property. The front is a triumph, although they didn't really make the most of the back. Inside, though, they successfully created a modern, stylish look throughout. Paul and Karen's biggest problem was the old bread oven that couldn't be moved. In the end, they protected it for posterity behind a row of kitchen units. It may have scuppered their plans to have one large open-planned kitchen diner, but the arrangement of the kitchen in the larger room and a snug leading onto the garden works really well. And with a big family house, which this is, it's great to have different areas that the family can go to in separate zones. So, Although it is, in a way, a shame that you couldn't have a great big open space overlooking the garden. It sort of ended up quite well, really, to have these different zones. Yeah. I think it's brilliant. I think it works really well. You've got a south-facing room with loads of sun. It'd be fantastic. But the bottom line with a development is profit. And with a conservation delay, what does this refurbishment cost them? You bought it at 300000 and and you were going to spend 160. What What did you end up spending? 150. So you spent £10,000 less than you were originally planning, which is very impressive. Not being able to do what they wanted to the house has ironically saved them £20,000. But even without that, their dream of £600,000 is looking even further out of reach. We have had two agents valuing it, and they valued it at 375 and 450 which... 375 is perhaps a little bit low, 450 is perhaps a bit optimistic, but if you did sell at that level, you, you would stand to make somewhere between a £75,000 loss and breaking even. No, no, I'm reluctant to sell it while the market's very unstable, I think. I'd rather sort of rent it out and let things stabilise than, than sort of, you know, don't want to, well, can't sell it at a loss, but I wouldn't want to, not having put all the effort in, not, not really to then have to sell it at a loss, that'd be just... 
heartbreaking. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you know how much you're likely to be able to get for it to rent? As long as it covers the mortgage. <laughs> we That's mind. good to us. <laughs> The good news is that with interest rates currently so low, their mortgage is £600 a month. So what kind of rental income could they get? The main issue that I can see with this property is the parking, is there isn't anything off street. And due to the size of this property, I feel that it'll be something that appeal to people with older children that may also have cars. The most popular property that we're letting at the moment are certainly the houses, but the two and three bedroom houses. The rental market at the moment is very, very competitive. There's been a huge influx of properties onto the market, um, so tenants are able to pick and choose a lot more than in previous years. This would be a fantastic family home. My only concern is, because of the size of this property, um, there would not be such a demand for it. I would give this property a rental value of £1,300 per calendar month. I would give this property a rental value of £1,450 per calendar month. I would give this property a rental value of £1,500 per calendar month. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that'd be, be a fantastic situation because we could be making money on the house and not having to sell it. I just think that's great. The only word of caution I put on this is that um, interest rates are at half percent. Mm. And the danger with very low interest rates and doing sums on very low interest rates is that when they go up, they go up a lot. Yeah. I think that's a bit scary for us. And uh, I think what we're going to make sure is we've got a fixed mortgage so we know as much about our costs as we can. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the, the right way to look at it, because at least if you fix your mortgage, you know where you are, and you're not going to have any surprises. No. It's a really nice house. Someone's going to be lucky to live here. Well done. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're pleased with the way it's turned out. So, yeah, it's better than we'd hoped. Well, no, as we expected. <laughs> <laughs> Although Karen and Paul planned to let their development to a family, it quickly became apparent that the family rental market was very small, so they changed their focus. Karen and Paul are currently marketing their house for rental at £1,500 a month. Next week, a special edition, the rules on how not to lose everything in a falling market. Plus two amateur developers. Go on, Dan, put your back in it. Set out to make a killing on an ex-industrial unit. This is great. See, I think we should cover the whole house in this. So you'll get a £500,000 loss. The whole thing's like a ball and chain round my neck. The best thing that can happen is this to get out of our hair, and then we do something else. Mm.